of stuff anyway. Let me give you two word pictures to tell you who you are. Yeah, you're all of this, but let me put it in practical terms. His next phrase was this, you are the salt of the earth. That's who you are. You're the salt of the earth. Now, everybody in Jesus' audience knew what salt was. Salt was a preservative. Of course, they didn't have refrigeration, right? So salt was a preservative. And for those of you who don't know, a preservative is simply this. It's a substance, salt, added to food. Well, you need to learn something in church, so here we go. Okay, this may be the only helpful information for the whole day, so pay attention, all right? A substance added to food to prevent decomposition. Because see, when there's no preservative, things decompose. When there's no preservative, things rot. When there's no concern, when there's no preservation, no preservative, things stink. It's a substance added to food to prevent decomposition due to chemical change or bacterial action. So here's what Jesus was saying to his audience, and here's what he's saying to us today. You are the preservative of the entire earth. You are the preserve. If you don't preserve, the earth rots. If you don't preserve, culture stinks. If you don't preserve, things go in a very, very, very negative way. And imagine the world he was speaking into. He was speaking into a world where might made right. If you wanted to know what the right thing to do was, you look for the people with the biggest army. That's how right was determined. Moral issues weren't really moral issues. Ethical issues weren't really ethical issues. It was who has the longest sword? Who has the most might? Women had no rights. Children had fewer rights. Mercy, compassion, generosity were not virtues. Those were things for the weak. It was a world we can't imagine. The only way you can imagine it is to visit some other countries in our world that still operate by that worldview. What we can't fully appreciate in the Western world, what we certainly can't fully appreciate as Americans is this, that much of what we assume is common human decency, what we assume is common courtesy is not common. It was learned that we still reflect the Judeo-Christian ethic that goes deep into our culture. What we consider is typically how Americans are is not how Americans are, it's how Americans learned to be. That we still reflect these fundamental issues that Jesus taught that eventually went all the way around the world and transformed cultures everywhere. Because we can't imagine that women would be treated any less than a man. And obviously there were times in this country when that was the case, and yet there was something that we knew intuitively was wrong with that and we fixed it. And intuitively we know that a person should never have ownership of another person. There's just something wrong about that. And eventually our national conscience caught up with the reality of that teaching. Isn't that true? And we know that children are precious, but why do we think children are precious when in other cultures children aren't precious at all? Why do we think that when someone is generous and they give of their extra to help those in need, why do we say that is good instead of weak? Why do we think compassion is good instead of weak? Why do we applaud mercy? Why do we stop and applaud the person that risked their life or risked their income for the sake of those in need? Why do we think that's good? It's not human nature. It's not common human decency. It's the reflection of a worldview that says there is one single God and that eventually you will give an account for your life to that one single God, and that God loves everyone you are ever eyeball to eyeball with, red, yellow, black, and white, they are all precious in his sight. Male, female, children. That there's an underlying belief system that came ultimately from ancient Judaism that then was expounded and exploded through the teachings of Jesus. And the first century Christians, the first century disciples, the first century brothers and sisters, they grabbed onto that and they believed it. And Jesus said, look, you have no standing, but you are the last stand. You have no political standing, you have no financial standing, you have no, you know, you don't have a grip, nobody's paying attention, but you, he said to that crowd gathered that day, you're the last stand. And if you aren't the salt of the earth, the earth rots. And if you think it's bad now, you give up, you go with the current, and you'll see how bad things really can be get. We can't fully appreciate this, but we benefit every single day from a worldview that says men and women and children have value, that men, women, and children are somehow made in the image of God, and that is not intuitive. Let's face it. We hear about human trafficking. 
We hear about slavery in other countries. We hear about the way children are, are trafficked and we think, how could anyone treat someone that way? It's very simple. They do not see the world the way that you see it. And the reason they don't see the world the way that you see it is because you have been taught to see the world the way that you do. And it was when Jesus knelt and he said, I wanna teach you how to pray. And he says, when you pray, you say, our Father, our Father. And all of a sudden, God becomes a God with a personality. And all of a sudden, God is no longer Jupiter. And suddenly, God is no longer the pantheon of gods that just played with humans. But somehow, through Jesus, we learn that God actually loves us. And if he loves you, he loves me. And if he loves me, he loves you. And suddenly, I have value and I have worth. And I better be careful how I treat you. And you better be careful how you treat me. And so when Jesus gathered with his disciples and said, by this one thing, by this one thing, by this one thing, all people will know that you're my follower, how you love, how you treat, how you appreciate, how you care for one another. And Jesus said, that's new and that's different. And if you'll allow it to, it's gonna take hold. You are the salt, the preservers of the earth. And he said this, not only that, you're the light of the world. To which we say, I don't wanna be the light of the world. I just wanna be a Christian and go to heaven when I die. Leave me alone, okay? I don't wanna be a light and a salt. I just, I prayed that magic prayer. Now I just wanna go back and raise my family and go to heaven when I die. Jesus said, no, 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 I don't know who taught you that. You're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Do you know what's so strange about this? Do you know how big the world was to that group of people gathered that day? It was small. No one traveled more than about 15 miles from home. They didn't even know about North and South America. There were continents that hadn't even been discovered. There are continents that they didn't know about that now have churches on them because he was serious. You are the light of a world you don't even know anything about. A town, he said, or a city placed on a hill. And the English version of the Bible has the word built, but the, but the translators that you know, translated this in Greek didn't use the word built. They used a little Greek word that's more like placed because it was intentional. A town placed on a hill cannot be hidden. And if you've been to that part of the world, you know it's flat, it's hilly, there are no trees, there are only shrubs, and they built towns on hills. And they built them out of white limestone, and you can see them for miles and miles and miles. The sun reflects off of them. At night, they light their oil lamps, and the, 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 you can see for miles and miles around. And Jesus said, just as a city on a hill, just as a town on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what you are. You are a strategically, you are like a strategically placed city. You're like a strategically placed town. That's why you're the light of the world. You've been strategically placed, to which we say, no, 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 I'm not strategically placed, okay? I was transferred here from uh, Orlando, and I didn't really wanna come, and once I got here, I lost my job anyway. Now I'm stuck in this stupid city. I'm not a strategically placed. I'm like a misfit trying to get back home. Jesus said, no. It may seem random to you. You are a strategically placed town light on hill no no i'm not see i was dating this guy in new york and he said let's move down south we moved down south then he dumped me for his boss good grief and now i'm stuck and i don't even want to be here my family's i'm not strategic i'm just trying to save up enough money to move back home jesus said no if you're my follower it may seem random seem random to you you are strategically no i'm not strategically placed see i want to get in fraternity a i didn't make a i didn't make b i'm in fraternity c i don't even want to be part of this group but my dad said you got to be in a fraternity you never get a job so now i'm in this dumb fraternity i don't want to be in i'm not a strategically placed light on a hill i'm stuck with a bunch of guys i don't even like jesus said if you're my follower you're light you have been strategically placed where you are he said this neither do people light a lamp put it under a bowl instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way in the same way as a city placed on a hill in the same way as a light placed on a stand in the same way as a city built and put on a hill in the same way as a light placed on a stand let your light shine before others and then here's how we read the next part that they may see your church attendance and say, dang, he's a good Christian. <laughs> I go to church, I'm going to heaven, leave me alone. I don't wanna be a light, I don't wanna be salt, I just wanna be a Christian. Cause I don't even know what that is, except my mama told me, you know. That's how we read this. Listen to what Jesus said to this group of people who never went anywhere and didn't have anything. Here's what he said. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see 
your good deeds and give glory or glorify your Father in heaven. You know, this is so powerful. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I want you to live your life in such a way that when people see your good deeds, they don't go, oh, you know, he's a nice guy. Oh, shoot, they're so nice. They see your good deeds and go, are you kidding? Who's that generous? Who is that nice? They keep bringing us food. I mean, I got sick and I, we hardly even know them. They keep bringing us meals. They take in those children. I mean, they're busy people and still they're, they're taking in children. They're, I mean, these are like the nicest people I know. They're like church people, which scares me, but good grief, what is up? They are the kindest, most generous. I mean, he can't do enough for you. I mean, he bailed me out time after time after time. I, I, I mean, I work for this guy, and I know he's like a Christian, which kind of freaks me out, and I messed up at work, and I thought he was going to call me in and fire me, and he sits me down and says, you know, you really screwed up, and you cost this company a lot of money, but I want you to know something. I know this is kind of weird, but as you know, I'm a Christian, and I believe in second chances. I'm giving you a second chance. And I walked out of that office and I thought, whew, I don't know about the Christian part, but he should have fired me. I don't know what's up with him. I don't know what's up. Jesus said, I want your good deeds to be extraordinary. I want them to be so extraordinary that people begin to connect the dots between your lifestyle and your father in heaven. I want you to be a dot connector. I want your light to shine so bright that it out shines everybody else to make people go, what's up with you? And when it's appropriate, you connect the dots for them so that they begin to give credit, not to you for your good deeds, but your Father in heaven. Whoo! Some of you are great at this. Some of you are great at this. Some of you, you're just happy to be going to heaven when you die, hopefully. You're a Christian. And Jesus said, I never called you Christian. I'm telling you who you are. Your salt and your light. Your salt and your light. And you know what? You've heard me talk about this before. In the first century, those Christians, those followers of Jesus, they got after this. They went down to the river and took children that had been discarded and abandoned and took them into their homes, even though they already had their own children. When plagues broke out in the small towns and villages, everybody fled. The priest, the pagan priest went first because they knew quickly about the plague because people brought their sick to the pagan priest and the pagan priest looked at the things breaking out and went, honey, pack, we are leaving. There's a plague in this town. And the Christians stayed. And they nursed people they barely knew through the difficulty of a plague. And they lost their lives. And people began to ask the question, what's up with these people? You know what else they noticed? These Jesus followers, they're not afraid to die. They are not afraid to die. They know something I don't know about what's on the other side. They're not afraid of death. And they live their life in such a way that the pagan Roman Greek community began to connect the dots. And in a matter of just a few hundred years, the world turned upside down. Not because of good preaching, not because of good teaching, but because of powerful living. Men and women who took seriously the admonition to be salt and light, salt and light, salt and light. So here's what I think Jesus would say to us today. Don't settle for Christian. What's that anyway? Be salt. Be light. 